Okay, uh, welcome to Li Wangzang's uh, presentation of his master's thesis. Uh, this will go on YouTube. So uh, yeah, if you speak, you'll be in the frame. Okay, let's start. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to my master's thesis presentation and thank you all for your coming. Uh, a brief introduction. My name is Li Yuan from the Department of Mathematics. And the thanks for my supervisors, Radesh and Marina, who have been supervising my thesis for the whole last semester. Uh, so before I start, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce what it's about uh, of this project. So this is a project that collaborated between math and the geography, social economical geography department at Uppsala University, or AKA the Geospatial Big Data Project. So uh, as you can see, that's why my that's why my supervisors are from two different departments. So which is kind of uh, uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, as for me, I was very fortunate to have this uh, opportunity to participate into this big project and uh, make some contributions. Uh, so in my thesis, my work were more like some kind of uh, starting point of this very big and uh, long term project introducing a, a new concept called distributed trajectory uh, and using some mathematical models to make some simple applications based on this new concept. And uh, of course, uh, based on the experiments that conduct, conducted from the geography department. So that's why we began to collaborate at the first place. So now it's time to start. So uh, this is the outline of this presentation. Uh, first, I will gradually introduce this most important new concept uh, called distributed trajectories. So what it's really about, uh, where it's from, and how it can be introduced into our study. And then using this concept, I will show you some uh, simple applications I have made. So mostly are some, uh, mostly are some visualizations about how to describe these distributed trajectories in an efficient and a dynamic way. And the last but not least uh, is about the testing of whether the algorithm for this whole project is scalable. So what I mean by scalable is whether the algorithm can be executed when handling the really, really big data. So that's one of our, so that's one of the most important criteria in big data area. So first section, introduction to distributed trajectories. Uh, well, it's not appropriate to talk about it right away. So what I'm going to do is to gradually introduce this concept, where it's from and why does it even exist. So the first thing we need to know is what is trajectories? Well, uh, intuitively, a trajectory is a movement of an object in the space as time goes by. Uh, which is obvious because given a certain time period, wherever you go, whatever movement you have, there will be a trajectory that's generated in this time period. Uh, in, uh, and uh, another thing we need to notice is that uh, uh, another, thing, another thing we need to notice is that in trajectory analysis, space and the time are two most important elements that we should consider, which brings us to a very important and the very spe and the specialized terminology called spatial temporal which is basically what i uh, which is basically what i just uh, described about this trajectory uh, especially about the importance of the space and the time so uh, so below is one of my personal trajectory at Uppsala that i have recorded so if we trace back to this trajectory Every single point would be representing an uh, information with space and the time, or, or the location and the time. And, the, and this plot is what we uh, ex express the trajectory in an abstract way. Uh, so each red point represents the spatial temporal information we have been recorded, and the arrow represents the both directional and the chronological progress during this trajectory. So now we can give the formal definition of trajectory. So a trajectory is essentially consisted by a sequence of data points. And each data point has the spatial temporal information. So if you take a look at this picture again, it's a 
if you take a look at this picture again, it's quite uh, self-explanatory. So during this uh, certain time intervals, each data point is time is also time non overlapped. Uh, so you, so that means you can't have two different locations at the same time, and the numbers of the data points during this time interval should also be uh, finite. So so one of our main goals uh, in this project is we are trying to express the trajectories or what we are going to talk about the distributed trajectories in an abstract and a mathematical way so we can know more about like the human mobility patterns the population density or the transportation control but this sort of the areas so uh, so one good way to do this is this uh, transition matrix so in this case it's pretty obvious uh, so during this time interval we move from uh, state one to state two uh, state two to state three and so on and so forth until we arrive at our uh, destination and keep still. So, so let's consider uh, let's consider a case that would be somewhat uh, extreme. So imagine the distance between each movement is really really close, or so even a really really small move would be generated two data points. So in this way, the number of data points in the trajectories uh, tends to infinity which would be hard to measure or quantify the accuracy uh, because, because the only reason that previous example was that simple is because we, we didn't expect that high accuracy. We just assume that place is one of places we have been to, but we will never know the exact, the exact coordinate of that place if we expect the really, really high accuracy. So which means uncertainty, which means we need to consider the probability. So this will bring us to what I have mentioned about these distributed trajectories. So in this section, I will show you how to manually generate the distributed trajectories given the previous circumstances. So that is manually adding some noise on the trajectory. So first, we partition the map into numerous extremely finer grids. So in this way, uh, so uh, so in this way, every single uh, final grid would represent a location that could that could have been recorded instead of a very general place. And then we artificially add the Gaussian noise to the to that trajectory in order to validate if the distributed trajectories would be generated in this way. So in this way, the previous trajectory that could that could be seen as deterministic with the noise would be probably probabilistic. So that means the trajectory will also be transformed into the distributed trajectories. So basically, this is the animation of this process. So after adding some noise, the trajectory would be look like this, given the certain parameters. And the, every single point, including the red points and the, the green points, are uh, all the potential points with the uh, probabilities. So now we can give the formal definition of distributed trajectory. So a distributed trajectory is one of numbers of probabilistic trajectories that composes this main trajectory. So as you can see, uh, this blue line, uh, which, was the, which was the main trajectory that has been distribu distributed into numerous uh, sub-trajectories and the sum of the probability for all these subtrajectories, including this blue line, so in this case, it actually turned into one of these subtrajectories, is summed to one. So, so anyway, this is just a one case. There, there are 81 combinations, aka 81 uh, distributed trajectories in this case. So with different parameters, different distributions, there could be uh, different numbers, and of course, with uh, different probabilities. So now we come to the next section uh, with all these concepts, all these ideas, how we can apply them into our uh, real life. So, so what I've been what I've been mentioning about this spatial temporal is already very common and uh, important uh, in our daily life. So uh, these three apps are typical examples of this spatial temporal property. So when you use them, you usually need to turn on the setting of allowing them to access your location. So
so that they can provide you a better service and be more useful. So this, this just to show you uh, this spatial temporal uh, application in our daily life. So, uh, but in, in this project, what we are dealing with is related to this mobile data. So, and especially what we are really in, interested into is also related to the spatial temporal element. So like under the mobile phone network in a certain area, which cell towers you connected to in which time. So this is the area that we study in this project. So as you can see, the, the area surrounded by these dashed lines uh, is the area that we studied. And this Voronoi diagram is constructed uh, so that each Voronoi polygon has a black dot and this, uh, this black dot represents a cell tower so that we can consider this whole diagram as a coordinate system. So this is actually a terminology in geography area called the Voronoi partition. So that, so that what we are, so, so what we are going to do is to sketch and to describe the people's mobility patterns under this whole structure. So, uh, so let's, let's put aside what we have been discussing about that uh, distributed trajectories. So let's just try to compute this transition matrix under this Voronoi partition and under this mobile phone network. And assuming these following conditions have been met. So that's what we already call the Voronoi assumption. So the Voronoi assumption is we assume the recorded location are inside that exact uh, in, are inside that exact corresponding polygons. So in this case, we in this case we assume all trajectories are deterministic. So we don't add any noise uh, on the original records. So based on these assumptions, the transition matrix is constructed like this. So so this transition matrix look very diagonal, uh, which is basically what we expect because the the transition usually means. Uh, usually means the time for that transition is very short. And of course, during, that, during this very short time, uh, we can possibly move from one area to another area. So most of the time, we'll, we will just keep still. So that's why the transition matrix is very diagonal. Uh, however, this whole thing is based on the Voronoi assumption. And this assumption is not necessarily to be right at all times. So according to the According to the experiments conducted by the uh, according to the experiments that conducted by the Uppsala University Social Economical Geography Department, uh, they concluded the fallacy of this assumption. So what they did was they comparing the recorded locations from both mobile phone network records and the GPS devices, and found that there are uh, 60, 63 percent of connections were actually beyond that Voronoi polygon. And the average distance between the mobile device and the, the cell tower that serves that device is, uh, is more than uh, 3,500 meter, meters. And most importantly, is 1.08 rings, uh, which I will elaborate this in the following slides. So uh, these two pictures uh, is more intuitively show you what I said about the fallacy of the Voronoi assumption. So during this time interval, uh, we notice that even if we are currently located in the in this corresponding polygon, uh, our connections were actually uh, from this different one. So uh, this is another very important concept called rings. So uh, remember what I just said, the average distance between the mobile device and the cell tower that serves that device is 1.08 rings. So, oh well, uh, sounds like a really weird measurement, uh, but it's exactly really pretty straightforward. So in this graph, uh, this centered polygon, this dark green one, is what we usually call the zero order of rings. And the offside of it, this, uh, this light green ones, is the first order, and this, is this yellow ones is the second order, and so on and so forth. So uh, the geography department has also concluded this distribution of ring distance. So for the first, for the zero order, it's only 37% uh, uh, proportion. 
which means there is only 37% credibility for what we did that transition metrics under the Voronoi assumption. But uh, with the first order considered, it would be reached to 75% uh, credibility. And with the second order, it will be 98% and so on and so forth. So, so that's computing the transition metrics one more time. But this time, we will take rings into our consideration based on the Voronoi partition and based on the mobile phone network. So just like uh, what we did at the first section. So, but in that case, it, it, was, it was based on the grid partition and based on the Gaussian noise. So the, the method for computing this transition matrix in this, in this case was not that hard. So as I said, the transition matrix usually means the transition from this current time to the next time, and the next time to the time after the next time, and so on and so forth. Uh, and here are something we need to notice. So in order to make the mathematical sense, each vector uh, has been normalized. So, so what I mean by normalized is because in the Markov transition matrix, the sum of each row should be one. So that means no matter how many rings we take into account, the sum of all these elements is always equal to one. And instead, these values in this case can be representing the confidence level, confidence level or what we already call the credibility. And this small n uh, represents, the, uh, represents the number of our objects. So in this case, all, uh, so, uh, so in this case it re represents 1,000 random mobile users in Sweden uh, in our study area. Uh, and the norm of this S is the number of states in state space. So in this case, there are more than 4,000 polygons, which would be a very, really, really big matrix. Uh, so, so I stopped after I considered three rings. So this is the transition matrix with the first ring, and this with the first and the second, and this with the first, second, and the third. So the confidence level is 75%, the 90%, the and the 95% respectively. So it can be said another way of the bias variance trade-off. So the simpler of our model the, with the higher bias uh, and the lower variance, but with, with the more complex our model is, the lower bar, lo, lower lower bias, but the higher variance. Uh, so let's stop for one second and make some appointments. So uh, in the following section for simplicity, like, so for, for the simplicity, uh, we would just take this one ring transition matrix as our empirical model. So it won't be too complex. So it won't be too complex and uh, too time consuming. And there is also something I want to tell you about this model. So every single blue point in this graph represents the possible transition, no matter how big or how small the probability is. So if we transform this plot into the probabilistic form with the color bar, uh, it doesn't look much pretty anymore. But if we zoom in this, uh, then we can have a, you know, then then we can have a very general look at it. So most uh, so most the big probabilities are distributed around this diagonal, so which is still uh, what we expected. So the reason it looks like this, the reason it looks like this is is simply because our study area is too big, but our sample our sample size is too small. Uh, so just imagine for the whole uh, big Stockholm area, there are only 1,000 people. So that's that must be sounds very crazy. So but, but this is just the minor issue. I just want to show you uh, what it really looks like. So uh, another way to build the mobility pattern is we construct the matrix called the origin destination matrix. So origin destination matrix is the matrix that each element represents the number of trips from origin to destination. So, uh, so for the transition matrix, we already consider the movement uh, sequentially. But for the origin destination matrix, we consider them periodically. So we don't. Uh, so we, we don't. We don't really care 
what would happen for the next section or for the next second, but instead we only care what would happen in the long term period. So as you can see, uh, edge here is the only variation compared to this transition matrix, which represents the time interval. We just assume the object would be mobilized during uh, during this period. And uh, even if they don't, we can just say their origin and the destination are identical, which is still valuable to us. So this is the comparison between the transition matrix and the OD matrix. So based on the first ring only, uh, so as you can see, which is quite different. So in the origin destination matrix, uh, no matter how big or how small these probabilities are, uh, there are, as you can see, there are much more possible transitions if we consider them periodically. We can, we can also construct what we usually call this time in homogeneous matrix. So for the previous, pre, for the pre, for the previous matrices, we constructed them with the premises of the time homogeneous, the time homogeneousness, uh, which means the transition probability uh, doesn't depend on the time, which is not accurate for the all time intervals. So, but for the specific study, we can consider the matrix to be time inhomogeneous, uh, which uh, to be time inhomogeneous. So that means the transition probability does depend on the time. So this is the formal definition of time inhomogeneous Markov chain. So for example, instead, uh, what we're gonna use. So for example, instead of the transition matrix all day long, uh, we can just uh, focus on the time, like uh, like from like for example from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. Uh, when people usually sleep. So in this way, the matrix will be even more diagonal. So we can also separate the matrix from like for example like the 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. and the 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Which should be look like the very uh, two uh, two different very uh, two two very different matrices. So uh, with all these resources, now we can make some serious applications. So one common application is about this forecasting. So what we have so far, well, uh, we have these various uh, matrices we have we just been constructing, and uh, we we also have this uh, latest. Mobile phone network, mobile phone network record uh, at a certain time. For example, so now it's uh, it's uh, it's around the 5 p.m. So if we want to make a forecasting from 5 p.m. to uh, 6 p.m., uh, I can just ask my supervisor to send me the this latest uh, mobile phone network uh, this latest mobile phone network record at 5 p.m. So what we can do for the latest mobile phone network records, we can vectorize them uh, as a distribution at this moment. So it becomes a, it will become a vector. And for those matrices, we can just use them as our uh, empirical models. So uh, with the vectors and with the, with the matrix, matrix at the same time, uh, one straightforward application we can come up with is, is this stationary distribution of Markov chain. So given the initial vector by raising the uh, transition matrix to the power of iteration times, uh, if the vector finally converges, then we can uh, then the converged vector is the stationary is the stationary distribution of this Markov chain. So in this case, we intercept this latest mobile phone network record uh, and vectorize them as the, as our Initial vector, just like I, uh, just like I said before, and we assume our empirical model is time homogeneous, so we can separate it into the several matrices in different times, and then we make some matrix uh, multiplication, see if they are uh, finally be converged. So if they are converged, then what we can do is to compare this stationary distribution, which represents the forecasted distribution in these different times. So here I chose two different uh, time periods and then make some matrix computation. So after, after numbers of iterations, both of them seem to be, uh, it seems to be converged. 
So we can just intercept this result at the beginning and at the end and make some comparison like this plot. Uh, so using this plot, if we are if we are interested in a certain area, uh, so that means interested in a certain polygon, we can take a close look at it and see how their distribution would be changed in these different times. So I think that's one way about of this forecasting. Or uh, if we find those vectors are not converged, we can also do this Markov simulation for the forecasting, uh, so which is another way. So, uh, so this is the algorithm for simulation in our case. So at first we have a coordinate all the time for each project, so for, for each object, and we can we can consider uh, we can consider this whole matrix to be time inhomogeneous. So so for the first matrix in this time period, we decide how many iterations for this matrix, and we draw out this uh, we draw out this row uh, based on that polygon number. And add them cumulatively, so we will have uh, so we so we will have the cumulative vector, uh, and uh, so we will have the cumulative vector, and then we will generate a random number from zero to one and compare this random number to that with that pre, uh, to, with this cumulative cumulative vector and find its position, so which will be uh, our, our next move. So, which uh, which can also be called as uh, called this simulated trajectory, and uh, so on and so forth by the number of the iterations and the, by the uh, different matrices. So, uh, also we should uh, and also we should also notice this uh, this uh, for each each polygon number also represents a distribution. Uh, so if you remember based on that ring distribution, so each of these polygon number also represents uh, this probability distribution based on our empirical ring. So no matter one ring or two rings or three rings, uh, whatever. So, so after this pro procedure is finished, we will have a whole list of simulated trajectories. So which has the exact the same data format of, uh, of our original uh, trajectories data. So that we can, so what we can do is we can use this simulated trajectory uh, to generate a new matrix for our forecasting, and uh, or we can combine our historical tra trajectories and this new simulated trajectory together and uh, reformulate our matrix with an update. Uh, so here, uh, instead considering this timing homogeneously. Uh, what I did at first was I made the simulation uh, based on this entire empirical matrix and compare this simulated matrix with our empirical matrix. So in order to validate if this whole procedure would be uh, credible, because this is a very big and a complex matrix. So if there has been some mistakes, these two matrices should be very different. So that's what we so that's what we're trying to escape. So here is a comparison uh, between these two matrices. So at first sight, they look like pretty the same. And if you take a close look at it, uh, if you take a close look at it, uh, there is a little difference uh, between them, which is exactly what we expect because we did the simulation entirely based on this uh, empirical matrix. So there is so if there is a large difference. Then it should be some problem. So that means if we can make sure this whole procedure is correct, then we can do the, what I said about that timing homogeneous simulation after this testing. Okay. Can I ask a quick question. Mm -hmm. So when you say simulated matrix, you mean the empirical matrix that comes from simulated trajectories, right? Oh, uh, the simulated trajectory comes from this empirical yeah. matrix. That's uh, right. Yeah. And then you take the simulated trajectories and construct another empirical matrix and that's what you call simulated matrix oh uh, yes the, so this yeah. simulated matrix is it's entirely from yeah. the simulation yeah okay. yeah it, it doesn't yeah. include any historical trajectory yeah. okay okay uh okay so uh so finally uh the last section the scalability test on our algorithm so uh so here is some background information about this section so why why do we need to uh, need this scalability test? So uh, so first exploring this 
scalable algorithm for this project, along with the future related work, is also one of our main goals. Uh, so and uh, and uh, also uh, the, the, those above analysis were done on a very quite small uh, sample size, which which was not persuasive to be described as a scalable uh, data science. So in this section, we we will artificially create a large amount of data. So that means this data is a pseudo data, uh, except it has the same data format with our original real data. So we can use them to pretend this is our real data in our algorithm. And we, uh, so, so that uh, for, for, for the above operations, we will record how much time will be spent with the different number of, of nodes or different number of workers for these same operations run in the, play, the Spark platform called the Databricks. So in order to observe if the operations can be performed on the huge amount of data or the, this massive amount of the data. Uh, and the code for this presentation can be found from here, uh, which is a GitHub repository I created. So, uh, so personally, I'm not very uh, satisfied with the code. I think they have a lot of room to improve with. So if you are interested in PySpark or Apache Spark or Big Data, uh, you are very welcome to contact me. Uh, so, uh, so brief introduction of the tools I have used. First, Apache Spark. Uh, Apache Spark is an open, it's an open source, uh, open source unified computing engine and a set of libraries for this, especially for this parallel large scale data processing on clusters. And it can be compiled by multiple widely used programming languages such as Java, the Scala, the Python, or R. So in my case, I use the Python, which can also be called the PySpark. Uh, and the Spark is by far away the most actively developed big data framework for the developers and uh, especially for the data science uh, when handling the big data. So, uh, and also something about the Databricks. So Databricks is a web-based platform for the Spark compilation, which provides the cluster configuration and the IPython style notebook just imagine when you, what we usually do, the, like the Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook, or the Anaconda, uh, something like this. So it's basically the same, except it's a platform for the Spark compilation. Uh, and in Databricks, uh, one good cool thing in this Databricks is we can choose different types of the drivers or the workers. So we can, we can by unclicking the option of the enable auto scaling, we can also control the number of workers, but uh, so uh, it will have the different performance, but of course with the different price. So uh, here is the uh, here is the interface for the cluster configuration. Uh, so one one of the things one thing that we, we need to pay attention to is this in enable auto scaling because in this test what we are interested in is the relationship between the uh, the time time span. And uh, uh, between the time span and the number of the workers, so we might want to unclick this, so we can control how many workers will be working for us. And uh, so this is another important thing we need to notice. So here we we choose the uh, eight workers. This is one of our options, which means there will be eight workers working for you, which which means it's a really really powerful machine. And uh, here is also something we need to pay attention. So this is the price. Uh, uh, this is the price for this entire uh, for this uh, for, for this for this entire operation. So as you can see, because we chose the eight workers, it will be a little bit expensive. But if we will choose, we choose the like the one workers or two workers, it will be much more uh, less expensive. So uh, so again, the goal for this section is we want to find out if our algorithm is scalable. So we generated a large amount of the pseudo data and, uh, and they should be uh, executed uh, on our algorithm, no matter theoretically or realistically. So at first we just created a piece of this pseudo data and the data looks like this, which is basically the format we want. So the user ID means the different objects and the simulated trajectories uh, means their location. And even if they, these are very uh, ridiculous trajectories because it's purely randomized, 
uh, we, we we don't really care. And uh, this uh, this i means the time step uh, in this case. So uh, so looks like this is a very spatial temporal. So what we're gonna do is we use this pseudo data to generate the transition matrix. So which is one of the operations in our project. And the transition matrix is being uh, and the transition matrix is being successfully generated. So again, this transition matrix is purely randomized. It it doesn't make it doesn't have any uh, really, it, it doesn't make any realistic sense. But so all we want, all we want to know is this operation is successful. So based on that, we can find the we, we can finally perform this scalability test. Now here is the uh, is our uh, test result. So for the functionality of our machine, we control this different number of workers, and for the size of this data. Uh, we use the number of rows with the million uh, as, as our unit uh, as our unit. So no matter how and uh, and also no matter how many rows, uh, no matter how many rows we have for each time, the number of objects uh, is always one million. So the maximum so the maximum amount of the data is one thousand and four hundred million which is 1.44 billion. So that's a really, really big data. So I think it should be enough for this, for this test. And it still can be uh, executed after, uh, after, six, after more than six hours and with uh, 16 workers. So if you are familiar with, with the concept of the scalable data science, so based on this plot result, we can conclude our algorithm is scalable so at least for these operations. So, so what I mean by scalable is the capacity of this whole framework can handle a growing amount of work or has the, or has the potential to be enlarged to accommodate that growth. Okay, so here comes to the conclusion. So anyway, this is just the starting point of this long-term interdisciplinary collaboration between math department and the geography department. So, uh, so in this, in my project, I just made some very basic application, but most importantly, on this new, our, this new concept, it's called the uh, distributed trajectories. And, uh, and for me, uh, I uh, personally, I think the one drawback of this, uh, of this project is the uh, the efficiency for this algorithm still has a lot of room to improve it. So I think this that's maybe the next thing we can work with. Uh, okay, that's all I want to say for this for my project. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Li Yuan? I don't know. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, you, you showed the slide with the, uh, where you compared the number of, of workers where, mm -hmm. uh, you, you had used. Uh, have you recorded the, uh, like the, the actual speed up to, to see how, uh, how, 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 uh, how strongly it scales? Is it, like, is it one to one or? Uh, uh, I, I didn't record that because okay. if you remember the data break interface in that notebook, yeah. so all, all they the, all the gave to us, I think it's just the, the time we spent. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's all I recorded yeah, uh, yeah. For, for, yeah. In, in this case. Okay. Yes. But yeah, I think what we should focus on is the, is the shape of this, of this result. So, so no matter how how large, uh, no matter how, how large our data becomes, mm -hmm. uh, it it can be still uh, operated with, if we only if we can increase uh, the, the number of the workers, the capacity of our machine. Uh, so yes. Are there any other questions? There are not uh, so many people come here, so I, I can ask a question, mm -hmm. please. So, so these plots you made mm -hmm. uh, came from those uh, transition matrices that yes. were not very sparse, right? Because they were sort of mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. non-zero yeah. rows. Yeah, and I guess internally you use you used uh, uh, a Spark mm -hmm. MLlib. Uh, 
uh, vector, sparse vector, right? Uh, for the transition matrix operations, I, I didn't use that MLI because it doesn't involve too much uh, yeah. on, to, from that library. Uh, because the, the most uh, the main thing I use for this transition matrix is from that uh, from that Spark SQL like. So that's the okay. main main feature uh, in these operations. But from that, but what you said about that MLI, yeah. uh, it's it's mostly from here. Uh, from from this uh, from this stationary distribution. Oh, I so when I do some yeah. like the matrix computation, I use that sparse matrix, the sparse vector, okay. and uh, and do the oh, okay. matrix computation. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah. Yeah, because I was going to say that um, because in the random data, the data you know the data is spread everywhere, right? Yeah, but if you take the, the the actual data that you got very recently, yes, yeah, and uh, uh, this you, yeah, recently. exactly. So if you use this to, for example, like redo these computations, mm -hmm. you know, the on, on you know increasing the number of workers too, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that this might have uh, more efficient. You know, yeah, the, the the real data rather when you construct mm -hmm. the the transition matrix from the real data. Mm -hmm. It should be much more concentrated on the diagonal, right? Yes, Which means yes, the, yes. the sparse vectors will be a lot smaller footprint. So mm -hmm. when, yeah, uh, it, yeah, it, it's just a. Uh, I mean, what I what I'm guessing is that it should improve your your time performance mm -hmm. should improve if okay. you use the sort of real real simulated data. Yeah. But, but in this case, I, I I don't have much choice to uh to to construct this this reasonable data. So what I did is just uh, do that randomly. So it's yeah, yeah, no, 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 yes. no. I understand. It's it's good. I'm just saying it might improve even more. <laughs> okay, which you can okay. at least discuss. Yeah. In your maybe in the real case it will be much more efficient. I think so. Uh, Marina has a question. It's yeah. more like a couple of comments, basically. On one of them, I'm even more optimistic than Raz. Because in real data, first of all, yes, there is a bigger probability to stay in the square you are than to move somewhere. But the next step, when you're moving somewhere, you can only use the streets. So between certain um, cells, there is zero probability to go because there is a building or some other way. So the actual mobility pattern will be even more sparse. Mm -hmm. And oh. the second comment is just a small comment that it's not only Uppsala University, it was also the team from Tel Aviv University in that paper. So just for the fairness sake. Yes, that's right. So distributed trajectory is uh, from uh, uh, Itzhak uh, Bennett and uh, uh, Alexei Ugolenko. And so this is actually a joint project that we had between Uppsala University and, uh, and, and Israel. Um, so yes, we just did some of the scalability stuff. So all the all the real thinking and definitions uh, really come from Tel Aviv. So. <laughs> yeah. So if, if there are no other questions, then mm -hmm. uh, maybe let's uh, mm -hmm. let's oh, thank Leon yeah. again and uh, call it a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good job. Thank you.